Patrick, when I wanted to understand the brain, I did my doctorate in brain research. I did most of my work on, uh, on mammals, and mm -hmm. we understood the functioning of different parts of the brain by the electrical activities between the two. Obviously, we don't do experiments on human beings, mm -hmm. but sadly, nature does those yes, experiments by creating diseases or different types of syndromes. But we learn a great deal about how the brain works when brains sadly go bad. What are some examples of that? One that springs to mind for me because I'm interested in sleep as well is um, REM behavior disorder. You know, with uh, rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, there's uh, typically uh, inhibition of many of the motor system. So you're paralyzed basically when you're in REM. But in REM, even though your dreams are very even active, your, your and brain aggressive. is active and so forth. But in REM behavior disorder, that paralysis no longer is operative because cells that create that paralysis are degenerating. So what happens? So what happens is the person, when they go into REM sleep, starts acting out their dreams. So you see that they, they will get out of bed, they will thrash in bed, their eyes may be open, and they will literally be hallucinating or dreaming a, a, a set of dream interactions. And they're typically aggressive interactions with REM sleep. So you, the, the patient will be punching some invisible figure. We've, there are cases, well-documented cases, of patients literally jumping out a window, trying to get away from somebody who's chasing them. They're, they're, you know, they're so convinced that the dream is real, obviously. So what this particular brain disorder does is allow us to see REM in action. So you learn a great deal about REM. From and, this particular and so you learn what the brain is doing in the normal case, which is right. inhibiting the body from acting out those aggressive uh, 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 dreams that we have. Right, and note that that's the opposite of the usual case. Usually, we learn, you know, if you get a bump on the head, you you lose something. Yeah, yeah. In this case, you you get the bump on the head, and it and and you see the expression of something you couldn't see before. Because of the, the because the it's normal function. It's released from inhibition. So the you're normal suddenly, function you're, was an inhibition. You're seeing these incredibly complex behaviors acting out a dream. So you learn about dreaming, and you learn about these complex behaviors. Yeah. It's one of the most fascinating disorders. It just started to be described in the 1980s. And, and you, can, you can specify that with a specific area of the brain that, yep. that degenerates. Right. Yeah. Yeah, in the pontine uh, sy system that creates the inhibition. Yeah. 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 Okay, what are some other brain defects that, that elucidate function? One of, the, one of the things that's fascinated for me, me for years is Othello syndrome. I published only one paper. My Othello, like from Shakespeare. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, I published only, my first publication was on Othello syndrome. But I find it particularly fascinating because it's associated with a very discrete change in behavior. You know, you don't get these uh, gross manifestations of complex changes after the brain damage. One thing changes. The belief of the patient that it's usually a his, his wife is cheating on him. No amount of evidence to the contrary will convince him otherwise. Hmm. He will, you know, a stain on a sheet will be absolutely convincing to him that his wife is ch cheating on him. And the, 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 the case I published, the, the person was put on a dopaminergic medicine. He, he developed this very florid Othello syndrome. Was utterly he was in his 70s. His wife was in this, her 70s. <laughs> And she's suddenly having an affair after, you know, you know, 60 years of marriage. And nothing could convince him. And this went on for months. We take him off the medicine. It's gone within two weeks. Mm. And, he's, and he sits and he says, I don't know why I was thinking that. I, I have no idea. But it's, it's fascinating because the belief fixation was so impervious to evidence to the contrary. You know, was this delusion. So no, he was he was put on this for other reasons, right? And so this was this was a, an unintended consequence of, of, effect, of, yeah. of, a, of an appropriate medical procedure. Right? It wasn't an experiment you were doing? No, no, no. <laughs> right, no. Right, 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 right. Okay. No. Just to be clear, uh, so for for other purposes, he was given this this regime of dopamine, right? And he developed the syndrome. This pe peculiar, very discreet delusional fixation. Now, now, have other people developed something similar to where you That's can generalize? That's why it's called Othello, because there have been other cases. It's rare. It's very rare. I'd yeah. say there's there's maybe 80, 
90 cases. Yeah, but that's still enough to let you know it's something real. It's, it's it, real, yeah. It, it's, how it affects an individual. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's quite dangerous because sometimes these guys will go and kill the wife. You know? Wow. It's wow. happened. So it's real. Wow. And, and, and what does that say about the function of the brain? It, it says that the this concept of jealousy is like a module, of, a, a, a cognitive module that gets affected by some physiological intervention. Precisely. I would say that's precisely what it teaches us. It teaches us that there are some circuits that are very dedicated to a single function, you know, making sure that whoever you're investing your genes in doesn't cheat on you. And, and the circuit is concerned with cognitions about that kind of behavior. And then these cognitions get automatically produced when the circuit is activated, and then they can become delusional. Mm. And, and they're modular because they're impervious to evidence to the contrary. Mm. So they're insulated from evidence. So I think it teaches us some very interesting things about how the yeah. brain mind works. And also in terms of the relationship between evidence and belief. In other yeah. words, evidence and belief are not the same thing all the time because biology can affect the degree to which evidence affects belief. Here, here you have an example where Indeed. evidence has no impact on belief, belief because of some biological problem. Uh, it has some impact because all these patients search for evidence to, but only accept evidence that supports the belief. Oh, it's you know, worse. Stain on the sheet yeah. or this guy saw headlights in his driveway and he was utterly convinced it was the lover's headlights. Mm. So it takes these sort of random stimuli and then they're fed into the belief, the delusional system as evidence for the delusion. Mm. And that's what's protected against contrary mm. evidence. Any other examples? Uh, well, there's par Parkinson's disease is an extremely fascinating and devastating condition. And here, um, the problem is uh, depletion of dopamine stores in four brain areas. And they lose motor functions, but they also lose higher, some higher cortical functions, what we call executive functions, are particularly impaired. But what I think is so interesting from the point of view of understanding how the brain works in mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. about Parkinson's, is that we find that dopamine is especially important for identifying salient events around you, identifying what's important, what's of value to you. Mm. And there's a value hierarchy. You know, some things are more valuable than others, and it all depends on these dopamine systems. Mm. So anything that involves uh, goal-directed behaviors towards identification of values is going to be supported by the dopamine system. Mm. And you, and you see that dramatically affected in Parkinson's disease. Hmm. So uh, overall, in terms of understanding brain function, in terms of, of uh, biological uh, trauma or uh, insult to the brain in different ways, uh, how, how significant is that? Oh, uh, extremely significant. I think uh, these experiments of nature, as you rightly called them earlier, have taught us uh, the most reliable things we know about brain functions. In my opinion, there, the, n nature can reveal secrets about the brain that we never even know to investigate experimentally. Mm -hmm. You know, who, what experimental psych psychologists would go and look at delusional belief systems, mm -hmm. but Mother Nature finds it important. 